Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy, and today I'm very, very honored and excited to be interviewing a very special space champion, Miss Veronica Moranitz. Ms. Moranitz is the Director of Legal Affairs and Space Law at Think Orbital. Chief Scientist at the Center for Near Space and a former mentor through the Space for Women initiative by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. Additionally, she's part of the SGAC Space Law and Policy Project Group, working to bring the international community together through space exploration. I remember reading about Ms. Mar Ms. Maranese's work on LinkedIn, and I was incredibly inspired by the work that she's doing in space policy. And I'm so excited to dive into her journey and learn about what inspired her to get into the aerospace sector. So welcome. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation. Yeah, thank you, Jitika. Thank you for having me today. And um, please call me Veronica. I'm really happy to be here and uh, I'm ready and excited to be able to spread knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so excited. You know, to just kick off our conversation, I wanted to start off by asking you, how does your typical day usually run? I know usually there is never a typical day, but how do you generally like to structure your day? Well, my day usually starts uh, really early because uh, I have a two years old daughter. So uh, toddlers usually wake up really early and uh, go to bed really late at night. So <laughs> it's uh, I, I try to to find my time to go through emails and tasks that may occur during night time. Because uh, my startup is uh, located in the United States and I'm in Italy at the moment. So most of the tasks uh, arrive to me uh, during night time. So uh, I try to figure out how to go through, through those. And later on, I, I take care of my daughter, make her breakfast, uh, carry her to daytime. So uh, it, it, Mornings are really confused, and <laughs> but uh, once she's settled and ready to to go to or my parents or to daycare, uh, I I start uh, writing because the first thing I do in the morning is working on my papers and articles and whatever I'm working at the moment, uh, all the collaboration I've got. Um, after lunch time again, uh, I'm taking care of her and uh, taking care of my husband too. Because, yeah, I have to to, to take care of my family. But afterwards, uh, and I I work on uh, on my duties as a uh, responsible for legal affairs, which include uh, working on uh, NDAs, uh, memorandum of understandings, and ensuring that the legal life cycle of the startup is going well. And um, yeah, uh, it uh, I'm sure that be, between uh, being a professional and a mother, so uh, my days are always full, but uh, it's awesome and I'm really proud of what we are doing while I try to raise my my daughter in the best way possible. Wow, that's so inspiring. I think it's so incredible to hear that you're able to enjoy and even if it's busy, be both a mother and also be a part of the startup and kind of pursue your dreams in space policy. I think that's so incredibly inspiring. A lot of times, um, you know, they think becoming a mother is a huge obstacle or something that kind of stops your career. But I'm really glad that you're taking that not as like a stopping point, but really as a growing point. And you're doing both at the same time. I really, really commend you for your hard work. I know it's not easy. So really, thank you so much for being a role model for so many women. And I actually didn't realize you had a um, startup that you're currently working on right now. Could you share a little bit more about the startup? Yeah, it's a space manufacturing startup. It's uh, it's called Tint Corbital, and we are bringing large, scalable, and in space uh, assembled uh, infrastructures in, in space. And we're working with an awesome team. We are spread worldwide, uh, while our headquarters are in Colorado, in the U.S. And um, yeah, uh, I I've been there from uh, moment one, and I I'm trusting the proce process. Uh, and being in a startup is not easy. Of course, uh, we are uh, we are working at our 
2000%, but uh, we are going toward the um, awesome, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, I believe I met Think Orbital at a conference before and heard one of the speakers who's run from Think Orbital. So it was, it was really exciting when I did read a little bit about you and your work with Think Orbital. So thank you for sharing a little bit about that. And, um, it, you know, when I was reading your background, one of the things that inspired me and got me excited the most was your background in space policy. A lot of times when people think of aerospace, the first things that come up are engineer, aeronautical engineering, you know, physics, more of like the very heavy STEM side. Um, but you don't think about policy, but policy is so critical in the space industry. So could you share a little bit more about what space law, space policy is, and why it's so critical for the future of the aerospace industry? Definitely. Yeah, uh, space law is seen as something that is futuristic, uh, something that we don't have to look after at the moment. But um, in fact, space law is an old uh, branch of, uh, of the, 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 uh, the space uh, activities. Uh, uh, space law was born during the, um, the Cold War and the space race. So um, it's it's not something new, uh, and also it's not something that uh, it has been uh, actively actively uh, innovated during during the, those uh, those decades that that passed in the in the space in the, the space era. So it's something that should uh, follow what are the next steps that we are going through in the, in the exploration of space and the human expansion in space and the space economy. Uh, it is absolutely key for the, the upcoming uh, steps that we are going towards in our future in space, because without uh, a good basis, a good legal basis, most of the activities that we are now planning to do in space, let's think about uh, space mining or space tourism, or even the uh, construction of uh, space settlements uh, on the moon or even on Mars, it is impossible without a good legal basis. Um, space itself is uh, an international space. So uh, when we will go and inhabit space, for example, we cannot use, uh, for example, US laws or Italian laws or Chinese laws. We will have to create from scratch the, the laws that will regulate those settlements. Because again, uh, from the text of the treaties that are now regulating space, uh, there won't be space colonies. All the settlements that we will create in space uh, must be international because there is the prohibition to create national colonies in space. This is something that was uh, established because uh, we, uh, we tried to avoid to take the Cold War in space. So um, when the uh, UN uh, avoided this possibility, what, what they wanted to do was uh, avoiding that one of the main nations, again, United States and the, what we are now calling Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, could uh, uh, have claims in outer space uh, or bring uh, nuclear weapons in space. So it is something that uh, have to, of course, has to be innovated because we are now in a different time, even if the geopolitical uh, um, question in, on Earth are sadly not so different from uh, the ones of the Cold War. But again, space law is absolutely key for the possibility to, to go in space and make economy in space too. Because at the moment, for example, uh, private property is not regulated in space. So if we want to go there and use space resources and make money from those resources, in this moment, there is not the possibility to do so because everything that is in space, like space resources and so on, uh, is uh, called as a common heritage of mankind. So it, it technically be belongs to all of us. It is something that uh, space na uh, national space agency and national administrations are trying to overcome. Let's think, uh, think about the 2015 uh, Space Act from uh, the United States and yeah, but, but 
going uh, like uh, every spot, uh, uh, every nation goes and tries to regulate space is not the right thing to do because again, space is an international space. So we should try to create uh, again, a regulation, an international regulation to use in space. Definitely. I think you bring up some really important points. You know, we're really looking to advance our technology to go beyond, to explore further, to mine in space. But we also need to keep in mind of like the regulatory procedures behind that. How are we going to do that safely, efficiently, and make sure that every country feels like they are a part of this space exploration and it's not just an ownership of one country. There are a lot of different aspects and dynamics we need to consider when looking into doing things as we further explore space and hopefully, you know, colonize one day. I think it'll it'll take a lot of regulatory policy related discussions as well from our side. So I think space policy is one of the most futuristic careers and um, it's necessary now and it'll be even more necessary in like the coming years as we're looking to have colonies, have bases, maybe potentially looking to space mining. So definitely very critical. And for students who are interested in space policy, how do you kind of navigate that? Is there like a specific path you have to follow? Like, do you have to get a law degree? Um, are you supposed to have a political background or like a writing background? What What are your recommendations in kind of pursuing space policy? Well, my, my personal background was not related to, to space law. When I graduated from uh, Verona University, uh, space law was not really known in Italy and was not really uh, something that was taught in a lot of universities. So uh, my background is um, international law, uh, terrestrial international law and, and human rights. So that was my, my background at the university. And I, I approached the space law during uh, the, my, my thesis because I always had a passion for space and I didn't want to create something that was not aligned with my, my spirit. So I, I tried to combine my two passions, the one for law and the one for space. And I've done a lot of research because, uh, again, the, um, the context was uh, was not so so known as, as it is today uh, and uh, the possibilities was were really little so uh, it was a pre pretty difficult again because for example none of my professors at the time had a clue about space law so when i was dis discussing my thesis uh, none of them uh, knew anything about me and, uh, and what, what i was saying and it was a little bit strange because i was talking, teaching them something that they didn't know and it was a strange moment uh it is not necessary this the, the the right and the only a path to approach space law. Uh, I recommend having a law background, of course, because again, it, it is important to understand terrestrial law be before entering into space law. And of course, international law is, is key. Uh, if you want to, to enter the space uh, uh, sector uh, from the company side, uh, I recommend international uh, commerce law as, as um, something important, but, uh, but also space policy, you know, you can approach space law from different angles and it, it is uh, not something uh, like astrophysics or engineering where you have um, a really clear uh, process of steps that you have to follow. What I recommend is to read a lot of articles and have a, a broad uh, oversight on what current space law is and what are the current issues of space law and to create your own ideas on it. Once you have your own ideas on it, your view, whatever you are thinking about space law, start writing write your articles defend your thesis and submit your papers not not to become a, a well-known name in the space law uh, field uh, it, it is not about fame it is about to let other people know your ideas and this is the the best advice i can give them Definitely. Yeah, I think especially what you were saying about how there is no one straight path. There's not like you do this, you do this, you do this, and then boom, you're a space lawyer. It's nothing like that. 
it's more so kind of getting the tools that you think are necessary, whether that be a law background, some sort of political background, it's really critical in you kind of pursuing that space law background. And especially what you're saying about getting some, you know, putting your thoughts and ideas out there and getting real world experience, like writing papers, interacting with professionals, attending conferences can go such a long way in you know, putting your voice out there and hearing also from professionals about what they think the future of space will look like and how we need to regulate that. So definitely, I think that's really critical advice. As a student myself, I'm like, oh, I have to do this, 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 this to do this. So it's really nice to know that there is never a straight path to get somewhere. Um, and, you know, what's really cool is I was attending um, ISDC, which is a conference that takes place in the U different parts of the U.S., and it happens to be in Washington, D.C. last year. And it was my first time hearing about space policy. I haven't really knew about space policy till last year. And um, in that conference, they were talking about international cooperation as we get to Mars and how some people were like, yes, we will do it. And others were saying, we're probably not going to cooperate because of a lot of the military related concerns when it comes to space exploration and technological advancements, because a lot of the technology is used in military and countries don't want to share their technology. From your personal opinion, just kind of off your guess, do you think international cooperation will be, will happen as we get to Mars, as we put humans on Mars? Or do you think that countries will try to get there first and it'll be more of a competition rather than a collaboration? Well, uh, definitely, definitely there will be a cooperation and we can see that there is already a collaboration towards Mars, which is the Artemis program and the Artemis Accords that are the legal framework of the Artemis uh, program. Uh, it is uh, uh, really interesting to understand this kind of cooperation because, uh, for example, for the Artemis Accords, it, they were not um, discussed with partners. It, uh, the Artemis Accords are something that the United States proposed to the partners, and if they wanted to be part of Artemis, they had to accept them. So we have an international cooperation where some states are accepting the view on space law that, that is given from another state. And this can lead to uh, some, some consequences. One of the consequences is that the future of space law regarding our presence in space on the moon and afterwards to Mars, which is the aim of the Artemis program, is defined by the view and the laws given by a single state and that are shared by other states. One of the consequences of this kind of cooperation, let's call it cooperation, is that if those rules are shared and are used by a lot of states, they can become a, um, an international law from what is called the diurnitas of or the uh, use and the constant use of, of a uh, juridical uh, um, uh, norm. So this is one of the consequences. And if something becomes um, an international law, the other states that are not uh, technically part of the program must follow that rule. So we could have an international law that is given by a single state. It is clear that some states, let's call it Russia and let's call it China, won't be happy about it. And I'm really scared and afraid that this can lead to um, a new uh, form of blocks like the ones in the Cold Era, the Cold War, which there were the West and East. This can happen in space. And uh, a beautiful way to avoid it could be uh, enhancing international cooperation and uh, again the rule uh, given by the United Nations. So the United Nations that are the right place to, to do space law should take up the lead and make those rules be before that the single nations take the lead. But again, so it's something really difficult because, uh, you know, in the United Nations, it's really difficult to make uh, different positions come together. There are some rules that avoid the, the possibility to have a, a statement or to adopt a rule. So it's really, really difficult. 
uh, a solution could be to create an agency, a space agency like the one of the IC. Um, but yeah, it, it, those are possibilities. To come to do, to your to your question, yes, it will be not very likely that one nation can go to Mars alone. Even for the technological uh, effort and scientific effort, but again, even for the uh, legal point of view, because as I said, what will be established in Mars uh, regarding uh, the uh, common life of people on Mars, common work of people on Mars, cannot be decided by the rules of a single nation. Except from the case that if that, that rule becomes an international rule. So it, it's a bit difficult, but again, we can uh, hope for international cooperation on it. Yes, definitely. I agree with what you were mentioning, especially with the Artemis Accords. I think it's definitely a first step and it shows you how we're building towards that more cohesive kind of international cooperation as we explore Mars and explore other, you know, celestial bodies in space and further beyond. And we're not just saying, NASA, this is the European Space Agency, this is uh, the Canadian Space Agency, we're trying to come together as one to achieve a common goal. And I think that's, that's definitely going to show it, to some capacity, to some extent, as we send humans to Mars as well. So definitely, I agree. And throughout whenever you're, when you were speaking, I could really see your excitement, passion, um, and the knowledge you have around space policy and how you're really excited to speak about it. And so I have to ask you the question, what was the uh -huh moment that inspired you to pursue a career in space um, and more specifically get involved in space policy? Like, what was your story? Well, uh, yeah, the, the moment when I realized that I could go, could go for space law and do something in this field was not the one I mentioned before, because when I, uh, I combined my two passions, space and the law, uh, for my graduation, my thesis at the university, I created something beautiful, but afterwards I didn't know what to do. Uh, I was a little bit scared, and so I, I tried to follow the common path, and uh, I went to a regular law firm and started working on uh, uh, private law, private Italian law. But I, I felt that something was off, that so, that thing was not uh, my right path. So I tried to find different solutions. I tried to collaborate with as much entities and institutions possible. And I tried to, again, spread my, my theories, my ideas. And uh, I, I tried to find the right people that could help me not enter, really enter the, the sector, but uh, express my ideas. So that was my, my first step. Once I had the chance to express my ideas, uh, I was uh, really surprised and excited too, because uh, I found that my ideas uh, were, uh, were heard and were, um, were very welcome in the sector. So that was maybe the, the moment when I realized, okay, maybe I can work in this sector. Uh, it was really difficult, of course, because I started doing research, so it, it was not something that really paid off. And I worked a lot and I wrote a lot without seeing any real money, so it was pretty difficult, but uh, I, I didn't give up and uh, uh, things take to things and now I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, that's so inspiring. I mean, there were like a few really important points I think you mentioned that a lot of students can relate with, including myself, when you were saying um, you didn't know where to go. Like you had this passion for space policy you discovered through your paper that you wrote in graduate school, but you didn't know how to go from there and how to really enter the industry. I and a lot of other students and professionals even that I've talked to, that's like their biggest thing. I have this interest, this really unique interest that not a lot of people know about, but now how do I use that interest how do I get into the you know industry how to get my foot in the door um and you have that conversation a lot and I think the biggest thing you mentioned is you started like networking you formed a community people who could support you and allow you give you uh the room and the platform to speak and to share your voice and to share your ideas and I think that's like the biggest key point that I also learned in my own journey so far is it's so important that once you have like a passion you find that community and the people who support you to express yourself 
And exactly what you were saying, you stuck with it, even if at a point of time you weren't earning anything and it was a very hard, sustainable, I guess, career you could pursue, but you didn't give up on it and just kind of work in a regular law firm. I think you stuck with it and you went with it, which is where why you're making so much of an impact today and are going to continue doing so. So really, I I'm so inspired by how you persisted and you stayed with it, even if it was difficult, but also more importantly, you shared how developing that community is so critical. And I think you answered my next question anyway, which was um, kind of what were your biggest obstacles, which I think was definitely navigating this industry. So I'll skip that question. And uh, my next question for you is from your experience so far in this industry, what excites you and what makes you nervous for the future of the space industry? Well, what excites me, excites me uh, of this industry is that we are creating something. It's space is something brand new. Uh, if we think about our history, it's something that started like 50 years ago. So it's uh, something really new and something that gives a lot of opportunities. Uh, what we can find in space is infinite. Uh, we can find uh, a lot of interesting things from the scientific point of view. We can find a lot of solution from for uh, space law uh, too, but also for economics. Uh, space could uh, absolutely change our global uh, shape of economy, uh, global market too, because we, we would have access to an infinite amount of resources. So it's something that, that can change all those flows that are affecting uh, Earth today. Yes, uh, space is, is uh, without a doubt something that can serve humanity. Um, when uh, space law says that uh, space resources cannot bring benefit to a single player, let's say a space agency or a private player, it is something that is not referred only uh, to the economic effect, uh, the economic return, uh, the money that you can uh, take from space resources. It's something that can be so uh, meaningful in the change of the pattern that is now affecting this planet that can give benefit to every single person, even those who are living in non-spacefaring nations or minorities and so on. So this is something that excites me a lot. And what some uh, excites me a lot about uh, space law in particular is that space law can serve as a tool to enhance international cooperation to um, uh, bring uh, um, human rights at the center, at the core of the future of space law. Because when we will be building the laws that will regulate, let's say, space settlements, we will start from what is already shared. And what is already shared are human rights. So this beautiful renaissance of human rights that will go beyond what is human itself, because you see, the word human comes from a Latin word that means soil, earth. So it's something tied to uh, this planet. So we will be going beyond the concept of human itself, and it is something really beautiful. What scares me the most is that we are what we are, and we know that uh, people can be mean, and uh, that uh, the economic uh, interest is uh, always uh, overcome the the humanitarian uh, issues and what we should be leaving as our legacy for the future generations. So we should find the the tools to to avoid. Different um, difficult uh, um, outcomes in space uh, as on Earth. So yeah, we should definitely uh, use international cooperation uh, as a tool to avoid su such uh, perils. Yeah, I, what you were saying is so beautiful, especially what you were mentioning with what excites you about space and how you're mentioning how space is a way to bring humanity together because we have a common goal that doesn't interest just the United States, just European countries, just 
countries in Africa. It's not just for one particular place, but it's something that can benefit the whole world. And the fact that we're going to work together, internationally cooperate towards a common goal will definitely bring us together. And space policy is kind of at the forefront of making that happen and connecting all these different cultures and peoples and ideas together. So definitely space is the way to unite humanity forward, but also what you're mentioning about humans and how it's actually derived word from Latin meaning soil. I actually did not know that. This is like a new fact for me. I didn't know this before. So I, I think it's so beautiful to think of it, how we're going to be going beyond that. And yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that I learned from what you just said um, and definitely what makes you nervous. I think there's always I hear very similar responses all the time. It's being cautious with what we're doing and not getting ahead of ourselves because human nature can, you know, take over itself sometimes and we can get ahead of ourselves and do things that can cause a lot of um, ripple effects, negative ripple effects. So definitely being cautious while we're exploring together. And so my last and final question, now that we were able to about your inspiring journey, as well as some of your insights into space policy, uh, my last question for you, is what advice do you have for young students regarding a pursuit of a passion in STEM, law, aerospace, policy, really just any career, something you wish you knew when you were younger? Like what's a piece of advice you could give the younger self, a, a younger version of yourself? Well, um, may I say something to young women because uh, yeah young students uh, are obviously all important and uh, every uh, young mind matters in this industry we are looking for inspired people and fresh talents but i want to say something to young women you can do it don't let anyone tell you no, you can. You just have to be a mother. You just have to be a wife. Uh, no, you can be both. You should be both if you want to. So uh, I, I was told a, a lot of times. Okay, now you are married. Now you are a mother. Leave your dreams alone. Uh, find something that is uh, uh, more suitable for an, uh, an housewife. Stay at home. Do do your duties. No, your duty is to pursue your dreams because we just have one <laughs> lifetime. It is better to fulfill all your dreams. And if you don't have the actual possibility to work with your dream from day one, it doesn't matter. Do what you can do, but always. Uh, grow your dreams even little by little write one line one paragraph a day uh, read one article a day uh, knock to one door a week a month but try to never let anyone tell you that you cannot do it because you're a woman woman women can and have to do what they want and this industry needs women because we are mm, the, the, the tie between uh, what is on earth and what is outside the earth because we are dual we are uh, what is in the private and what are what is in the public we know what are uh, biological let's say duties but no women is uh, owes a, 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 any anything if you want to be a mother be if you don't feel like to do it don't do it but we are always uh, uh, struggling between what we should do for the, um, the cultural statements that uh, people are giving us and what we would be like doing. So we are always uh, shred be between those two ideas. But again, you can be who you want to be. So. This is the, the main advice and don't be afraid to pursue your dreams because again, I, I was scared and I didn't want to disappoint my parents and those around me. I tried to stay down, leave my dreams alone, but it was so wrong to me and I was hurting myself. So don't hurt yourself and do what makes you happy. 
Wow, that's so powerful. I think that is one of the most powerful statements I've ever heard, and it definitely touches deep in my heart as well. I've met a lot of young girls in different parts of you know the world, talked with different students, especially young girls, and they would tell me how their parents would tell them, "Oh, you should you know go into a safe career choice or get a degree so that you know you can get married and you can become a great mother." And a lot of times you're being told as a woman that you have to live a certain way or here are the career choices that are best for women. And it's surprising and it's shocking that it still exists in this day and age. And I'm very lucky to live in a place or at least in, grow up in a family where that never happened to me. But there are so many people where in this world you are told what you need to do and to live up to certain expectations. Um, and I, I'm so glad you said what you just did because I think it'll inspire any girl who listens to really follow their dreams, to step out of the norm, especially a career like aerospace. You know, aerospace industry has historically been very male dominant. Um, a lot of conferences that I attend, um, I, it's still male dominant. Um, and, and I see very few women in conferences. And it's not because women are not interested in aerospace. It's probably because they don't have access to certain rooms. So really what you were saying about women achieving their dreams, following that, going through with it, and don't letting anyone tell you you can't do it because women are the most powerful people. You know, we put our minds to it. We can do it. So I think what you just said was incredibly inspiring and something I will definitely take to heart. And I know every single girl out there will definitely take to heart as well. So thank you so much for taking your time to do this interview. I was incredibly inspired every moment that you were speaking. And I learned so much about space policy and advocacy as well. Um, so really, really thank you so much. I'm so glad we connected through LinkedIn. Thank you very much for having me today. It was a really a pleasure. And when you need me, uh, I'm here. And if uh, anyone has any question or any doubts, I'm always uh, available for, for young people. Thank you. Yes, we will link all your social media platforms down below so that everyone can connect with you. And thank you.